to speak a little bit uh, about about what uh, we call in Buddhism we call rupa. Rupa usually translated as form or physical form, material form, body, something like that. In <coughs> in uh, Buddhist thought or Buddhist philosophy, the rupa or the the physical aspect of existence is usually uh, is usually kind of primary. Say, for example, in in groups like we have the five aggregates, which is very well known um, classification scheme in Buddhism: form, feeling, perception. Uh, volition and consciousness or awareness, jnana. And so rupa is the first one, the starting point. Sometimes uh, we find that in Buddhism, rupa is not um, treated with a lot of respect or dignity. And uh, it's uh, even in the, the the classical definition for rupa we find in the in the suttas you find rupa di rupang which means something. How do you translate that? You can't really translate. It's actually one of these kind of puns, Indian puns. They like to pun on words, but you, if you were to translate it, you would translate it something like it's deformed. That's why it's called form. Something like that. Or you might say, it doesn't matter. That's why it's called matter. Yeah? So, or perhaps you'd say, it shatters. That's why it's called matter. That's quite a good one, isn't it? It shatters, so it's called matter. So, And we often hear the the, um, the saying, almost kind of the slogan, is that that Buddhism is all about the mind and development of the mind. And so, uh, there's a lot of emphasis uh, in Buddhist teachings about development of awareness, like I was talking earlier about meditation and so on, development of consciousness, and not so much talking about development of the body. So when we think about development of the body and material things, you know, we think about, well, we're going to go and do some exercise or do some yoga or something like that. And these are always, within a Buddhist context, always a little bit kind of fringe practices. So this is slightly um, uh, ambiguous relationship to form or to the body, which is actually not uh, inappropriate because the, the body is, in fact, uh, ambiguous, isn't it? body is a, a great source of both pleasure and of pain and uh, very often it seems as if our lives are little more than a, a search for pleasure and an avoidance of pain to be experienced through the body that's a, that's a kind of an, an unreflective life doesn't it if we, if we see somebody who doesn't grow beyond that yeah, I mean, in a, in a sense, it's quite. You think it's quite normal, maybe for young people that that's where you, you know you're obsessed with. You know, you're kind of very physical when you're young. You know, you like to do sports, and you, you, know, you like to have a girlfriend or a boyfriend, and you like to, you know, go out and experience all the pleasures of life and so on. And uh, you know, you think that that's that's fairly normal as a developmental phase. But you also think that if well, if you don't get kind of grow up a little bit past that once you reach twenty, thirty, forty, then you think there's maybe something a bit stunted, a bit. Uh, unfulfilled about that kind of life. It's a bit pathetic, actually. So, what I'd like to do this evening is maybe just reflect a little bit about different aspects of the body, or rupa, the physical world, and how we can relate to it 
uh, from a Buddhist point of view or from a spiritual point of view. Uh, so the first thing to understand is that um, rupa as a, as a conception or a way of thinking or relating to matter or the physical realm is not, uh, doesn't come from the same angle as we do, for example, in Western science. Uh, so we, you know we don't have the the there are of course similarities, but it's not the same kind of thing. So for example, the the basic classification of rupa or form, we we talk about earth, uh, water, uh, air, and fire as the four great elements. They're called four. We in the English translation we say four great elements. And if we look at those four things, earth is like the element of solidity, water is liquidity, air is gas, and heat or fire is the is energy, isn't it? Yeah. So that's actually what we learnt in school, isn't it? Yeah. You have the basic three states of matter. Yeah. So it's basic kind of uh, physics. You have three states of matter and and energy or heat is what causes you know matter to, to transform from one state to another. So that kind of classification, although it's obviously very, uh, in a sense, very simple, is not too distant from the kind of the, the uh, classification scheme of, of Western science. Uh, but where the difference comes about is in the, the perspective of that or the, the, the way of knowing it. Okay, so from a Buddhist point of view, the way when we talk about the matter or the physical realm, it's it's okay. Let me just come back again. When from a Western point of view or from a scientific point of view, when we talk about matter or the physical realm, what we're talking about is is or at least wants to be some kind of substance. Okay. So some kind of objectively existing entity. And that's what in Western science is looking for. It wants to find solid entities. Of course, the more it investigates and the closer it goes, the less it finds solid entities. The more it finds buzzing strings or, or, or various kinds of particles, which aren't even really particles, they're just potentialities and energies and movements and so on. So you, you, you start out thinking that the material world is very solid very there, very present. And uh, the further and further you go into it, the less there is. You know, there, there was a, there was a famous uh, d philosophical discussion where there was a discussion, I can't remember the name of the philosophers now, but they were arguing about uh, the philosophy, two f philosophical ideas of idealism and realism, okay? So that, that the world outside doesn't really exist. And the idealist, the realist philosopher uh, kicked a rock and said, I refute it thus. Kick. <laughs> that's how you refute it. You come up against the actual real world. So that's quite nice as a piece of philosophy, but it's very bad as a piece of physics. Because if you analyze the act of kicking a rock in terms of physics and what we know about subatomic particles and so on and so forth, the more and more you go into it, the more you realize that actually what's going on there is some kind of movement of energies, which may be on a, on a sort of subatomic level is actually integrated with consciousness in some way. So from a scientific point of view, you move from a mm, what we call a naive realist point of view of assuming that the world exists out there independently of the observer. And there's been this kind of slow but almost um, inexorable move towards seeing the world as somehow linked with the observer or the observing consciousness. How far you want to go down that road is, of course, very controversial. And, and scientists, there's no agreement among scientists as to how far you should go there. But there's certainly been that shift. And who knows where that shift will end up in. Yeah? So from a Buddhist point of view, you start out with exactly the opposite uh, set of assumptions. Okay, so you don't start out with a set of assumptions that the world out there 
objectively exist, nor do you start out with the assumption that the world does not exist. Okay, they, these are these are what the Buddha would call metaphysical assumptions. They're not they're not verifiable. They're just a matter of speculation. What we start out with is the reality of experience. Okay, what do we actually ex what it, what does our experience consist of? That's got in and of itself that's got nothing to do with the question of whether the world out there exists or not. It's got to do with the question of why are we suffering? Okay? That's the question that the Buddha was trying to answer. Okay? So, uh, because the, the methodology is different and the aims are different, then uh, there's no mm, compulsion for us to assume that the, 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 the results of investigating matter or form according to Buddhism are going to be similar or not similar to those of Western science. They may or may not be overlapping or similar in various ways. That's a matter for inquiry. Now, so when we talk about rupa, what we actually mean is the, 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 our, our perception of various physical qualities, okay? So we perceive uh, various physical qualities. So uh, sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch, for example, okay? These are all rupa, okay? Now rupa, in this sense, one of the best trans... Rup, the, the, the root meaning of the rupa, or the, 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 the most, most basic meaning of it, is a, a form or a shape or an image. Okay, so a rupa is uh, uh, a shape. So, for example, like a Buddha, you know, Buddha image we call a Buddha image is called in Pali a Buddha rupa. Okay, so like the shape of the Buddha, the form of the Buddha. It's not a real Buddha, but it appears like a Buddha. So sometimes even appearance is quite a good translation of rupa. Uh, and so, in that sense, it's used for all of the objects of sight. So anything that we see. Is a rupa. Okay, that's the basic meaning. From there, it's extended to all kinds of material qualities. And so it's how the physical world is presented to us is rupa. Now, when we start to consider that, uh, we can make a number, we can analyze that in a number of different ways. So one way is in terms of just as I mentioned in terms of the senses, sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, present to us different qualities of things, which are quite different and quite distinct. When we see, what do we see? When we, we, we first take it, when we open our eyes, we look, what do we see? We see people, we see a room, and so on and so forth. No, we don't see any of those things, right? That's just people and rooms and those kinds of things are concepts that, that are created in our mind, yeah? What we actually see is light, okay? So we see light, that's all. That's all we can ever see. Light um, uh, appears to us or, or comes to us in certain patterns, it's not random. So it has certain patterns and we can generate meaning from those patterns. It has a certain order, a certain predictability we can learn. We see a tree one time, we can then see a tree another time. So we can learn from the similarities of those patterns. And the quality of light is something which is quite different from the quality of sound. Yeah? So again, you know, what do we hear when we're hearing? Yeah? Do you hear a voice? Do you hear cars going past? No, you don't hear those things. You don't hear voices, you don't hear cars, you hear sound. Voices and cars and anything else that we're hearing are constructs of the mind. What we're hearing is sound. Okay. Same with smell, same with taste, same with touch. All of these things have their own quite distinct and quite particular qualities. So one of the things that we can do in meditation is to investigate these. Because what happens is when we go through our lives that we, we, for example, we say, I met such and such a person. 
I, I spoke to them. Well, of course, w what is that experience when we analyze it? Well, there was a certain sight, there was a certain sound, maybe we shook their hand, so there was a certain touch, there's certain memories and thoughts and so on. These are the things that are going on, and so we label that as a person. So this is one of the things that we do when we're doing uh, what we call uh, vipassana, or insight meditation, is we, we break down the different avenues of sense experience to get a more realistic idea, to understand how it is that we make up the world that we live in. So we don't take these things for granted. So this is one, um, one means, one avenue of investigating the notion of rupa. Another means is in terms of what I mentioned at the beginning of the, like the four elements. Okay? And so these, again, are four different kinds of physical, um, physical qualities. So we shouldn't think of them. Elements is not really a good translation because elements gives the idea that you break it down into something elementary and then you build this like an elementary substance. Okay? Well, it's, not, it's not really what it means. Properties, perhaps, might be a better example. Four great physical properties. So you have like hardness. So you call that... Pali uses, or the Buddhist terminology uses a concrete terminology, uh, so it's called earth, okay? But when it's defined and uh, um, described, it doesn't mean literally earth, it just, it's, it's used in an abstract sense to use any kind of hard quality, okay? So any kind of the quality of hardness and solidity we call earth. The quality of liquidity which has the property of cohesion, we call water. Uh, the property of, of uh, uh, gaseousness, yeah? which has the quality of moving, we call air. And the, the property of uh, heat, which has the quality of aging. It changes things, yeah? and we call it the fire element. So when we're uh, another way or another mode of investigation, in our meditation, so one way, one mode of investigation in meditation, we can we can choose to sit and think. Okay, I want to meditate on the the the, the senses. So you, you 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 just watch and pay attention to how light appears, how sound appears, how smell appears, and so on and so forth. And and then you 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 understand the nature of your experience better through that meditation. Another way of approaching uh, a vipassana meditation on form is through uh, understanding the four elements in your experience. Yeah? So as you're sitting, uh, you know, you can imagine, for example, you think, well, what, what about the earth element? Okay? So what's the, the element of, of, of hardness about me as I'm, as I'm sitting there? And so you can, you can investigate the different hard parts of the body, for example, the bones and solid things in the body. And you can play games with that. Yeah? So you play different kinds of imagination, like you can try taking your bones out. Okay, what would it be like if I took the, my backbone out of my body? So you go, and you slump down, and all the different parts of the body taken out. What if my skull wasn't there? Yeah? And the whole body, and you imagine it would just, the body would just sort of collapse in a kind of creepy blob on the floor yeah? if you didn't have any bones. Yeah? And, uh, and so you can build it up. So th again, this is just games you play to learn to understand these qualities. But, you, but in meditation, you actually experience the thing itself. Okay? So you experience the quality of hardness. Right? So this is why I'm saying that it's, it's not the same as, say, what a scientist would, would, um, would, would talk about if they're talking about the, 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 the physical state of solidity. Yeah? What we're looking at is not uh, an externally definable physical state. What we're looking at is a particular fit property that's experienced by the mind. And uh, the same for liquidity, water, air. And so when we look at air, the kind of the different the, the movements in the body, and often often air is equated with the, the different energies that move through the body. You know, so you have these ideas like chi or prana and so on. And in Eastern philosophy these are sort of equated with the air element. So when you're sitting in meditation you can feel uh, different kinds of uh, energies, movements through the different parts of the body, and so this is this is uh, one way of investigating the air element. Or else, of course, watching the breath being another way of investigating the air element 
uh, in the body. And uh, heat as well, okay? So again, you uh, contemplate very um, often very obvious the quality of heat. So as you're sitting there, as I'm sitting here now, I can feel my, my feet are a little bit cool. You know, my, my torso is quite warm and so on. So you can sort of contrast the different feelings of uh, warm and cool in the body. And so this is another uh, avenue of investigation. So as you do this, you're actually getting to know yourself. Yeah? You're getting to know your body. What does it actually feel like? Yeah? What actually is this thing that I l lug around with me <laughs> all day and uh, tend to ignore most of the time? Yeah? And uh, so you get to actually feel what it is. So these are, these are some of the ways that we can use to investigate these things. Now, um, when we are looking at it, there, there's a number of different um, angles and attitudes that we can have to the body which will... Uh, um, oh, I'm sorry, there's something I should mention first before I go on to that. So that, that I've mentioned, I've mentioned the, the investigation in terms of the, the different senses and sense objects, and I've mentioned the investigation in terms of the, the elements or physical properties of the body. But the other thing which is also very obvious and quite important is a, a distinction is between uh, internal and external physical form. Right? So internal physical form being me, right? <laughs> and external being everything else. Yeah? And so obviously we have a very different attitude towards what's going on here inside this body than we do to what's going on in everybody else's body. Yeah? Or not just everyone's body, but the, but the physical perception of the physical world in general. So of course we tend to much more take this thing as me. Yeah, so we're much more attached to it. Yeah? So if I break my leg, I'm much more concerned about it than if you break your leg. I'm sorry about that. All right? But that's just the way it is, okay? And uh, so, you know, when we get hungry, we have to feed our, this stomach, you know? And uh, if I need to brush my teeth, I brush these teeth. I don't brush your teeth. So, and when I'm tired, I rest this body. Yeah? And um, all... More likely, when I'm tired, I drink another cup of coffee for this body. But uh, so we have a very different uh, emotional and also um, not just emotional but intellectual uh, relationship with this as compared with what's going on outside. And so this is another mode of investigation in meditation: is to reflect on the difference or the similarity between this internal and external, yeah? And so to, to do that, and of course, by doing that, you, you start to break down the difference between the inner, inner and the outer. So the pattern that's always talked about in the Pali, ajhatang wa bahidhava, ajhata bahidhava. So internally, one contemplates internally, one contemplates externally, one contemplates internally, externally. Yeah? So it compounds the two words, so it's like a synthesis. And so you contemplate this, just as this is, so is that. Yeah? Just as my body, so is everybody else's body. Yeah? Just as there is earth element in here, so there is earth element outside. Just as there's water element in here, there's water element outside. And so then that, that creates a two-way emotional dynamic. First of all, it means that we're less narcissistic. Yeah? We're less concerned specifically with our own body and less caring less about that. But it also means we're more caring for, for everybody else. Yeah? Because you realize, well, it hurts me if my body's sick. Yeah? I don't like it. And other people feel the same way. Yeah? And so it creates more, more compassion. Yeah? And this is actually one of the, the, um, the uh, very interesting things we find about these teachings of the body is that even though if you look at traditional Buddhist attitudes and especially Theravada attitudes towards the body, you don't find a lot of positive stuff. There's a lot of things saying, oh, the body's impermanent, it's going to break up, and so on and so forth. And if you read like the classic uh, Theravada meditation manual, the Visuddhimagga, it's very noticeable, the, the, um, the, the um, almost exuberant 
joy which uh, the author Buddha Gosa takes in describing things like the, the, the thousands of families of worms which are inhabiting your guts, you know, and they, the way that they, that they shriek in joy when you, whenever a morsel of food appears and they come to eat it, or the, the, the elaborate descriptions of, uh, of rotting corpses and, and all of these kinds of things, as, op as opposed to the dry and minimalist descriptions of things like compassion which are treated in just a few terse paragraphs. This is quite a, a, a noticeable um, a characteristic of the Visuddhimagga. Uh, and so, you know, you do find quite a lot of this, this kind of stuff. And, 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 and that's, all, that's quite valid and it's quite valuable, yeah? And there's some very wonderful and quite funny descriptions in the, in the Visuddhimagga. They've highly, highly recommended their, their, their passages on these things. It talks about one, for example, the contemplation of food. Yeah, so the contemplation of food is a terrific meditation, and uh, so you know, <coughs> of course, food being what keeps the body going, right? And food being defining uh, a, a, a defining characteristic of all beings. Yeah, so all beings have to eat. Yeah, this is what the Buddha said. What is the one thing? The one dhamma. Everyone has to eat. That's the one dharma, and it's very true. If you look even at like one-celled organisms, yeah, you know, you have you have beings. They don't have to, you know, they don't have to have sex or anything like that. They just split off and so on. So even those very basic biological functions they don't do. But one thing they do have to do is they have to eat. Every every cell has to take nutrition in, yeah, to supply energy. So contemplation of food so you know normally you know you've got this kind of plate and it's got all this delicious stuff in and 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 you you, you have this kind of perception thing where you where you you just want to focus on that that presentation you know it's like a bit like the um those kind of japanese restaurants where you kind of get the kind of the beautiful presentation of the dishes you know exactly what it's going to look like and so on and you that, that's it yeah the anticipation of it but of course that's only a very fleeting moment yeah once you've eaten it once you put it in your mouth, you've chewed it up, it's revolting already. Yeah? Yeah? You wouldn't take that piece of slime out and then offer it to somebody else, would you? Yeah? Even if you saw a starving beggar in the street, yeah, would you? You're walking past, you've taken a bite of your burger, you say, oh, please, please. Oh, yeah, have, have, have this. <laughs> I've, I've chewed it already for you. Yeah? Even a starving beggar you wouldn't give to that, yeah? And yet a moment before you thought it was the most beautiful thing, yeah? And that's just the start of the journey. Yeah? From there on it goes down the throat, into the guts, covered in acid and slime, a thousand kinds of worms leap shrieking shrieking on it and <laughs> devour it into the bowels, gets turned into shit, is pooed out the next day. That's it. Goes into the soils, decomposed, becomes nutriments plant some more food in there, grow it again, and the whole cycle goes around, yeah? And so the whole cycle goes around and round and round, and that's it. So that's, that's, why, that's the contemplation of food. And of course, Buddha goes, it goes into elaborate lengths to talk about, like cause if you're for the monastic, you, you're kind of, he talks about like the, the, the trouble it takes to get food, apart from anything else. You know, how much work do you have to do to get it? You know, And even in the monastic context, you know, he talks about, you know, you have to, get dressed in the morning and you have to leave your nice meditation and the beautiful chanting behind the, beside the lovely shrine and you go into the courtyard and you step in a pile of the sick novices vomit and then you walk out of the door and you have to go past the corpse of a rotting dog or a rotting elephant and you walk down the street and <laughs> all, of the, all of the kind of going on and on and on. So, but it's very true, isn't it? You know, the amount of work we have to do as individuals and as a society and a culture to sustain our bellies is quite extraordinary. Yeah? And, uh, and the amount of pain and suffering that it causes to others, yeah, we were talking about that the other day. We had this environment talk, religions and environments thing, and we talked a little bit about the impact of um, meat eating on global warming. I mean, of course, all, all food consumption has an impact on the environment, especially the way we do modern farming. But uh, meat eating even more so because it's as, as uh, uh, animals are higher up in the food chain, they require a huge amount of extra uh, energy and resources to produce the same amount of nutrients compared to vegetarian food. And so this is like a very, very serious issue.
uh, in our world. And so, you know, th these are all the kind of the suffering that, it, that comes about through uh, food and through the body. So this is one thing that we have to understand, yeah? And, and again, it has this kind of ambiguous quality to it, that kind of contemplation, because on the one hand, the food is a blessing, yeah? And so the very fact that there is food and the very fact that, you know, we live in a, in a country where we can get plenty of food and it's good food and, you know, we're not starving, we have abundance. And so this is a blessing, yeah? But the very fact of that blessing means that also that blessing can be withdrawn, yeah? It's not, it's not ambi unambiguous, it comes with its cost. So these are, these are some of the kinds of uh, meditations that we can do. Uh, now, in addition to, um, uh, in addition to, so 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 this is this is how in traditional Buddhist presentations, uh, very often the body gets a bit of a bad rap. Okay. One of the reasons for that being that. Um, we're often, of course, very attached to the body. So it's not, it's not, we don't give it a bad rap because we're kind of negative and depressed and cynical about the body, but because we want to get a certain distance from it. We don't want to be obsessed with it and, and absorbed in it. Okay? So that side of things has to be presented. But what's perhaps not as emphasized and made clear is that certainly in the, the suttas, uh, in the early Buddhist teachings, there's also very strong very powerful positive presentations of body contemplation as well. One of the most beautiful ones is we find in these, these suttas where uh, the Buddha teaches uh, you know, contemplation on the, on the elements, yeah? for example, like contemplation on the earth elements. Yeah? And he says, develop meditation that's like the earth. Yeah? It's a very powerful meditation. Develop your mind that's like the huge earth because the earth is so vast that that, that Whatever happens to it, it will never feel any hatred or ill will. Yeah, it just accepts the rain falls on it. Anything happens to it, the fire burns it. Anything happens, we throw rubbish on it, and the earth doesn't react. It doesn't feel anger. Or develop meditation that's like, like the ocean. Yeah, or meditation that's like the sky. Yeah? And so you use these these very positive images of uh, the physical realm. Uh, to develop the meditation, just like the sky, yeah. And so you, like, it's like you're expanding or raising your mind up to that. Now, in fact, that's actually very characteristic of Buddhist meditation in general. Is that we start our meditation with body contemplation. So any kind of meditation, for example, like um, in Satipatthana, the four Satipatthanas, uh, body, feeling, uh, awareness, and dhammas or principles. And the first one is the body, and that's where you start your meditation. Okay, that's the foundation of all the other meditations. And you know, if you look at all of the contemporary, uh, certainly the Theravadan uh, meditation schools, all of them, uh, and this I think is one of the good points of modern Theravada meditation, is all of the the schools very strongly emphasise on mindfulness of the body, yeah, as a foundation. And certainly within the Thai forest tradition, which is my background, this is what the, the, the monks in that tradition talk about again and again and again, is contemplation of an awareness of your body, which can be done through many, many different approaches. I've already spoken of some of them, yeah, of contemplating the elements, contemplating the sense bases, uh, contemplating the breath being another very, very important way of doing this. And in each case, what you're doing is, is fixing on Paying attention to something which is um, has a certain relative, not an absolute, but a relative degree of solidity and substance, and relatively permanent. Okay, so of course the body is impermanent, but it's not a, not as impermanent as the mind. Yeah. So if you try to sit down, and you know. It's a good meditation, you should do that. You try to sit down, I'll watch my, my thoughts, for example. It's extremely hard to do, yeah? And watch, I'll, I'll, I'll pay attention to my, the, the contents of my mind. It's very difficult. The mind's so fleeting, it's so hard to get hold of, it's so nebulous. So we start out by paying attention to something that's 
relatively solid, like the body. And uh, that gives us a foundation, that gives us a basis. Paying attention, and of course, as you do that more deeply, you begin to realize that the body isn't separate from the mind. So we start out like choosing or focusing on a particular aspect of our experience, a physical aspect of experience. And as we go into that, we like go through it into the feelings, into the perceptions, into the, the awareness, the consciousness. It's not something separate from the body. It's not like you do one and then the other, but it comes inside it. And so in the, um, the descriptions that we find in the, in the suttas of uh, very advanced states of meditation, like jhanas, are always described in very embodied terms. Yeah? It's very, very important to notice. Sometimes when we think about uh, advanced states of meditation, the sort of mystical absorptions and things like that. We we think of it like as a kind of a, it's like an image of a separation, like the soul or the spirit's kind of separated from the body, and we kind of go into this abstract mystical world. But that's not at all how the Buddha described it. Yeah, the Buddha described it as being completely immersed in the experience of like the similes of uh, like the lotus, which is born and grows underneath the water yeah and just in the same way as the water would pervade through the entire lotus in the same way that, that the, the rapture and the bliss of meditation pervades through the whole body yeah so you have this very pervasive um, aspect to it and that's something which uh, is extremely important to develop in meditation and so this is why when uh, I'm teaching the metta meditation, I always emphasize to bring the feeling of metta into the body, not letting it dissipate and becoming like a, like a vague kind of feeling that's just floating around the stratosphere. It's embodied because that's where our emotions actually happen. Okay? And so this, of course, is one of the... Um, basic realizations that any meditator will realize is that when they have emotions, that it affects your body. Your guts tighten up, you know, your back tightens up. You, you feel emotions in all different parts of the body in all different ways, yeah? And doing uh, different kinds of, you know, body work practices will help you to release and deal with those emotions. So doing things like yoga or massage or tai chi and so on and so forth will all help to ease and to, to make more flexible those kinds of feelings. But on an on a even deeper level than those things in meditation, uh, you will learn to integrate those emotions and those emotional states within the body. That can be a very, very painful process. It can be extremely demanding. Uh, and it's, it's, it's very much the case that we uh, lock up and hold um, you know, the neurotic tendencies or conflicts or whatever within parts of our body and they can remain there and they can remain tight for many years at a time. And they can even like physically manifest as, as like actual, uh, you know, they, not that they can, but they will manifest as, as actual like kind of deformities and so on in the body. Like you, you, you hold your body in a certain way for many, many years, and then your body becomes like that. Yeah, and uh, it's difficult to 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 grow out of that. You know, you hunch your back over in a certain way or something like that, and it's actually like the emotional force of that, repeated and held over many years drives your body in a certain way until even the, kind of the muscles and so on are actually formed in response to that. And so it takes a time to unlearn it and it can be very painful, but of course very rewarding. When that succeeds and when you can learn to, to, to integrate and purify uh, the emotions that you're experiencing within the body, you, uh, uh, there, there is such a wonderful and powerful feeling of just being at one. 
And this is where all of those body contemplations are leading towards. They're leading towards a feeling of being at one here now with my body. And not being dissipated, not being dissociated, not being scattered, yeah? but being at one. I'm going to use like a word, you know, I use these words dissociated, you know, it sounds like a very kind of modern word. The, the Pali word is wikitang, literally means thrown around the place, okay? And the, the opposite to that is sankitang, means collected. Yeah? So these words, you can even use like the kind of modern terminology, but it has these very uh, exact parallels in the in the Pali scriptures. And so we feel like reassociated or recollected or reintegrated within our body. And when you have that feeling, then, then what, one of the things that comes with that is this incredible feeling of gratitude. You know, it's, it's not possible, or at least it's extremely difficult, but probably not possible to, to develop meditation without a body. I don't know if anyone's ever tried. <laughs> yeah? And, uh, you know, you can see that. You can even see that. You don't have to. You don't have to be reborn in a disembodied state. You can even see that if you try doing meditation while lying down, for example. Yeah, I mean, you do, if you try to meditate while you're lying down, almost always you just fall, lose mindfulness and fall asleep. Yeah, and one of the things that shows you is that there has to be a certain degree of awareness of your body. Yeah, and a bit of an energy putting into your posture in order to keep your awareness there. Yeah, and so otherwise the mind just slips away. So this is, oh, then that which reminds me, I should have mentioned that earlier, but one other extremely important um, aspect of body contemplation, apart from the ones that I've mentioned earlier, is awareness of your postures. Yeah? And it's also very, very important for development of meditation. And uh, uh, very, very foundational, something we all need to do a lot more of. Yeah? Just being aware of where is your body now? sitting, walking, standing, lying down, yeah? and all the minor postures and movements. And it's very important that we all do some of this practice as part of our regular meditation practice. So, you know, we see that the, one of the easy, best ways of doing that is just doing some simple walking meditation, yeah? Just walking back and forth, simple path, maybe five to ten paces, being aware of the movement of your feet as you walk, yeah? Just that. If you can't walk, you can even do the same thing just by moving your arms, yeah? just, just to have like a set movement of the arms, and just paying attention to that. If you do that as a, as a special or dedicated practice, then you can help to learn to bring that and carry over to a greater sense of awareness in your everyday life. Yeah? That's extremely important. And again, you know, what's, what's the outcome of that? What are you actually doing? Well, what you're doing is you're you know, if I move my hand like that, I'm actually placing my awareness, I'm shaping the focus of my awareness so that it forms the same shape as my hand. I'm bringing my awareness into that. And so this is what we, we mean when we talk about integration of the mind. There's not like my hand's over there and my mind's over there, yeah? There's not like two things, but there's that one thing. So that's in another extremely important practice. So all of these things are leading to a sense of collectedness, a sense of oneness. So con contemplation of the body, awareness of the body, understanding of the body is, um, even though it's only, in a sense, always, as I mentioned at the beginning, is always a preliminary part of our development, yeah, it's, 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 it's exceedingly important as that preliminary part, and it takes us a long, 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 long way, you know. It's a, it's a, it's a foundational practice which we should not, which is, which is um, unspectacular, yeah. What are you doing? You're just kind of aware of these things. It doesn't, it's not, you know, it doesn't seem like any sort of big deal, yeah. It's very unspectacular. But it's very, very grounding. Yeah, and uh, recently, when I was in uh, on retreat, and I did, did two weeks retreat in my kuti, and 
you know, just got really back into enjoying doing walking meditation and just very, very simple walking meditation and just feeling just the pleasantness of just being with your feet, one foot after the other, just walking along the path. And it's very, very sim you really appreciate those, those very simple um, joys and simple kinds of satisfaction. So this is my uh, talk for you this evening on rupa, or rupa khanda, as the foundation of practice. So I offer that to you for your reflection and encouragement for you to do some body contemplation, be more aware. And does anyone have any comments or questions?